So for the last part of um, this lecture, what we'll be doing is looking at the three muscles around the hip, or we could think of this as the, the shoulder of the hip. And that'll give us a good foundation that we could build into the limbs, um, legs, and then arms up from here. Uh, following this, I'll do a few uh, timed examples from the body site so that you could see this in a more uh, kind of streamlined, practical, process-based approach. So same thing as the first three. I'm going to be looking at each muscle as a shape, identifying where the placement and landmarks are to help situate this muscle. And then we'll look at uh, all issues of perspective, which I'm still thinking of as building form intersections, trying to think of wrapping these muscles around existing structures or showing them in front or behind volumes or other muscles that we've we've built and put together. So the first is going to be the largest. Right? We'll work with the gluteus maximus. We can make a let me make a list over here. So we'll be going in this order. Gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, and then we're going to look at the tensor fascia. So um, in thinking of these muscles, I think of them like your shoulder. Um, for more pra practical reasons in terms of how to use them. The three directions, so if we think of gluteus maximus on the back, gluteus medius on the side, tensor fascia in the front, uh, relative to the hip in this kind of box form of the pelvis, for me, I think of uh, as movers of the hip or leg in those three directions, right? So if this is a, a little mock pelvis and we're we're just thinking about how we can summarize those as uh, muscles that produce an action. Here's our hip. Gluteus maximus, we can think of as pulling this way. Tensor in conjunction with the rectus femoris can be pulling the leg that way. And then I often think of the gluteus medius as pulling this way or an abduction. So that's one simpler way to consider each muscle. Um, in terms of placement, it's also useful for me because I'll think of gluteus maximus on the back, gluteus medius on the middle or on the side plane of my box, and the tensor in the front. So in terms of placement or thinking of landmarks, I'm trying to cover all these different planes of the side of the pelvis or this, the pelvis box. And then the perspective is, um, going to be taking that box and then extending it into the muscle shape. All right, so now let's do that with a, a little bit more precision. So what kind of shape could we use for the gluteus maximus? Really, any shape is fine um, that you can come up with that you know, somewhat looks like. One thing I like or one shape I'll tend to use quite a bit is uh, like a butterfly shape by thinking of one egg positioned at an angle, and then beginning right here at the bottom of that sacral triangle. So the gluteal fold is going to begin right underneath there. And then I always try to push this at an angle this way. Then the second part, you're going to get the whole of the butterfly, would be taking an opposing ellipse and then tilting it the opposite way. And this I'm going to bring halfway down the femur. So I'm thinking of my femur height or leg height there, and then I bring this down halfway. And so maybe longer than most people would um, intuitively put it. So we can have, uh, for as far as attachment goes, part of this connecting to the femur, or part of the maximus. We could have another part joining into the iliotibial tract or band. We can look at that more so from the side view. But consider in terms of just simple shapes, like we've been doing with everything, if we look at it symmetrically or as a whole, it, you could use the little sacral triangle if it works for you or if you think that's useful, a butterfly shape. Might not be the greatest shape. You know, that, that's why it's open-ended here in terms of how you want to assess or think of these. You might have one that's way better. But the reason that I'll use it or I like it is that I can build the form intersections with each one of these shapes specific to their volume, right? So by identifying an egg that's just on the pelvic block or box, I can set this up 
I can also see how the lower portion of this shape fuses and might lead into the volume of the femur or cylinder um, as a separate form or shape there. In addition to that, I can also squash and stretch these independently, right? So let's say I put all the weight on one of these shapes. If I, let's say the, the leg is holding the pelvis up there. Now I know that this shape is gonna squash. So it's gonna get shorter and fatter. And then maybe this will start to squash also. So using ellipses or using spheres or eggs in terms of defining muscle shapes is to me something very much limb oriented, right? For the torso, you get more iconic looking shapes like bullets or columns or corn dogs or whatever they are. In the arms and legs, it's more spheres and triangles, which is good and bad, right? It, maybe it's, it's harder to remember those shapes, but they're easier to squash and stretch. Um, let's say conversely, if all the weight's here, then this leg's stretching, so or passive, so maybe that causes this to elongate or stretch a little bit. So you have your you know animation or basic beanbag idea here, of these pinching and stretching. That's why I like it. Um, so with that as full disclosure, you can choose whether or not that's something that you also want to use. Another, um, let's get rid of this guy here bugging me. I don't know why it's there. Uh, another alternative could be, I've seen people make a cashew, right, which would be a kind of taking these two and making them into one shape. And make, either one is fine. You could also just make a giant egg. It's just whatever you think would be most, most useful or resonates with you. In terms of seeing this from different angles, so I'm definitely going to see it from the side view here. One thing that I'll do on the side in terms of thinking my eggs or cashew or whatever it is that you like, um, let's go with the butterfly. I'll put one on the back of the pelvis so that we have this angle. And then I'll have one that change or that will change in transition here. And then you could have you know, different shapes here depending on fat. But one thing that I do think in terms of helping me remember the whole of the side of the hip is and we're going to go for something stupid here, um, thinking of a donut or a tire. And then as far as the tire is concerned or donut, think of your great trochanter in the middle, which you know, we have here. And then all of these muscles kind of around or uh, with a larger area of mass directly above and then an immediate or an abrupt drop off into that. So Visualizing a simple three-dimensional form for me is an easier way of uh, making the muscles practical and, and workable than really getting into the weeds with striation and tendon and stuff that's harder to balance while also making a drawing. Thankfully, I'm not going to have to worry about that from a front view, so that gives us a little bit of a break. Uh, let's color this in and then we'll we'll add it to our back. So that's my shape. We've talked a little bit about how gesture can be a part of that in terms of storytelling. You know, I think of each muscle in this sense like a micro argument for the gesture that we set up at the very beginning. The gesture is still the most important story element, but every time I have a, a muscle, I have an opportunity to build an argument that supports that gesture. Um, or not support it, right? Like, um, you know, here these are just passive and non-consequential. Right? They don't, they make an argument for uh, a relaxed area. And so now all I have to do is really think about the perspective as it relates to something that's form-based or form intersection. So I'll just do one side here. Let's do the, the near side, and that way you can see at least a simple example of um, what I'm trying to get at. So I would always start this the way that I laid it out on our map or mock skeleton, I'm gonna take and make one egg. And now that I have the box here, I have limits, right? So I'm gonna put my egg just right here. In other words, this part of the butterfly or cashew is limited by that plane. So having the planes in this sense help me to isolate and think through where the shape should be and should be proportioned. As soon as I hit my corner or my transition to that box, 
that's where I would start to look for the second. And I'm going to drop this shape down, or this egg, uh, and I'm trying to manage the placement with the cylinder. Right? So when I drew this in, I'm trying to think of it as just hitting the back of that cylinder. And I boxed this one out just to be even clearer based on the hamstring tendon, which is the well, this area. So you can use that. Um, I use that quite often to find planes in the cylinder. Just because sometimes the cylinder is a little too vague, right? Um, it's difficult to know where the sides, front, back, inside of a cylinder are. But by adding one step in terms of seeing the landmark of either the fibula or the hamstring tendon, um, you can use a line up from there to help uh, or help create something that's more planar. In any event, that's where this is. Once I bring it down, I'm going to start to sweep that over to the outside and just give myself maybe a little tail or just a reminder that it's halfway down. All right, so let's color this in. That we have the whole thing. Once I have this done, this is my shape and placement. Also have gesture here, right? Because I'm more flexed, more of a C curve. Now I'm going to use a darker value or color to push the form intersections, which means that when I have this. Um, I'll come back, and uh, you saw me do this with a lot of the other muscles here, just start to push on the sides with the influence of the underlying perspective. So this line, this first one, is the top of that box. This is moving now with the sacrum. This part goes with the back plane. There you go. So it borrows this line. In terms of building form intersections, I always use the dominant perspective, in this case the pelvic box, and I influence the subordinate form. So even though this is an egg, all of its sides are getting planed so that it relates in perspective to the box under. Let me do that here. Right, so if I wanted, I could push it this way, right? because that would be more with that box or that back plane. As soon as it hits that corner, now I'm going to let this drop. And I'm using a C curve because C curve is pinch. If I had it um, longer or stretched out, it would be drawn with an S. Now for this part here, that's dropping. So this is kind of creating that donut structure. Um, here's a better indication for where we might find the doorknob or the head of the great trochanter. And then here, I'm going to push on the shape this way. And, and now it also builds continuity with that form or the cylinder. And you could also have just gone like that to it. And that would be describing the bottom of the cylinder or the volumetric contour of the cylinder. And that's it. So that's always my first step. Shape, placement, gesture, build form intersections, any step. Beyond that would be to identify the muscle for its own perspective. And so maybe I would say, well, I have that box. This would be what's going on in my head at this point. I did a decent enough job of making it look like that belongs on the box. So the last step is to describe its own volume. And so in there, that always is just adding the corner. Does this muscle have its own mass? I'm going to say yes. So we could give it its own form here. This still goes with the perspective of the box, but it's just adding to it. The same way when we did the heads, we did or designed a nose on top of the front of the face, but that nose had its own perspective. This goes this way, kind of thinking the tire dimensionally here, right? Something that's spiraling or moving around the great trochanter and then down. So that would be my setup or my depiction of the gluteus maximus. Let's look at the medius. So here we have number one, um, flexing the leg or bringing it back. This is all kind of the abductor mass that I would think about as well. Gluteus medius is a muscle that I'm just going to look at on the side. And this would be for pulling the leg out. Right? So if we saw... Um, an abducted leg or the leg pulled out to the side, this would be a flex muscle or a C curve. 
Um, the ab and adductors can also work at the same time to lock the leg in place, and we'll cover the adductors um, when we do the leg. So one thing that I'll start to look at is from the sacrum, if you drop a line down, this is a good way to find the placement for that gluteus medius. So that's one way you can find it from the, the back. Um, I think an, an easier way or something that I do more often is to find the side plane of the box as a whole. So let's say, you know, just to take this off for the side so that the maximus isn't in the way. We said the maximus was on the back. Medius, in terms of simplifying the perspectives and the shapes, I almost always just make all of the side. Right, and so, yes, there's going to be um, a deficit or um, a loss of anatomical accuracy. That's part of what is going to happen no matter what when drawing with some type of design or aesthetic in mind. Um, here it's for the, the sake of practical, practical means to have a process, something memorable and, and usable. So think of, with that disclaimer, think of this as like a piece of pizza. Maybe even like the ridge of the pelvis could be the crust. I told you this was gonna get stupid. And then, you know, the pizza tapers and it's tapering down to the top of the doorknob or the top of the great trochanter. So we have this thick to thin. And so whatever there, um, as far as this line coming down, is me cutting the maximus out. Right? So that means that I want all of this to be prominent and then this little area I'm thinking of removing. So let's give that a color. Somehow I landed on puke yellow. So there's the gluteus maximus shape. Uh, and now let's clean up the, the maximus sum. So one thing to keep in mind too is you know, double check your rhythm in terms of are you creating that asymmetrical balance all the way down the figure. If we did our erector spinae to abs, think of now this rhythm in terms of curve, high point of curve, the maximus shape, right? that you still keep getting those asymmetrical flows and rhythms down the body. That's also design or for the sake of clarity and color coding, something I'm clearly a big fan of. Let's make our medius shape there. And then I think it's also possible that we'll see this in the front, depending on the view. So let's also give it our shape here. And I think this is a nice um, illustration to think of how it comes away from the pelvis, which also brings us to our last um, idea, which is perspective. So let's say that's our medius. It's heading to the top of the great trochanter. Um, here I just have it kind of passive, let's say, or stretched. If I wanted to make the idea that uh, this leg is being pulled away, so imagine now that the leg's going that way, I could just pinch that. I could show that the leg's being pulled out by pinching this, and then I would look to study the antagonistic group or adductor and stretch it. So the inside of the thigh, in other words, would be elongated. All right, so we have pizza, 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 front, back, side, and now let's incorporate it into the existing drawing. Okay, so in this one, to kind of start to flesh out the rest of the hip here, I'm gonna be looking for anything that would be on the side of the pelvis. And I'm thinking of this, just so we have something that's a little bit more um, literal in terms of a draw over here. So that would be the, the pizza shape that I'm looking for. In terms of making the drawing and keeping that dimensional quality, this line or the top of the pizza, I purposely think of as simple in that way so that that line can match the plane direction so that it goes with the perspective. As soon as you don't respect that, you flatten the drawing or you've made a contradictory uh, illusion in terms of the way that space is being read. Here, start to pull it down. And then it may be a minor or of minor concern. 
Um, but here, in terms of how I've drawn it, remember that if this is our plane for the hip, that the great trochanter comes off of that, right? It shoots out this way. And that's important because I always want to show that the medius is a diagonal plane, even if it's really minor. Uh, in the drawing, I try to show that it projects out from the hip. And one way you could show that is by you know, here, even at the bottom of the pizza, try to adopt the form language or the intersection as it hits the sphere that's pushed away, and the sphere being the doorknob of the hip or the great trochanter. So there, and then at the top, it goes with the box. So those are two perspectives that I bridged with this shape but I really want to get the idea that this is coming out. So that would be the last step, right? That's building the form intersections. Is it overlapping? Is it wrapping? And the last thing is, can we find any type of um, inherent perspective to this? So uh, let's force it just to make the example and say maybe it has a little corner or a little bit of mass there. I don't know that that's the case. That it probably doesn't, but you get the idea, right? That you'd, if you wanted to push the idea of recognizing this as a volume, that you could see that it has a thickness, which is the last step there. So here's our pizza. Like you could think of this almost, uh, this whole area, and think of it like the deltoid of the arm, except giant, and that it's still allowing the, the shoulder of the leg, in this case, to be able to move. Right, in all the different directions around the hip. Uh, let's also do that from the front. That way you'll get a couple different views of it. We'll swing back over here. Okay, so here in, in this one, we can kind of see the, the light, and this is the, kind of the advantage of this as a process. I know this is in light because that's the side plane of the box, and light's hitting it on that side. And that's my pizza shape, right? kind of nicely defined there. We bring that over here, and I'm going to line it up the same way. Comes out, fitting around or on top of that hip, and then let's fill it in. And then I always clean up with a darker line to create form intersections, wrapping lines, and teal overlaps. Here's a little bit of a corner. And so um, as we go on, I hope that you'll just start to notice me using those things. Those are the only things I'm ever doing throughout the drawing. So there's the hip. Uh, maybe on this one, we could see since the leg is pulled out of it, more of a C-curve. So that'd be something that you could draw in there if you wanted to push that or describe that as an action, maybe more of a C versus something that's closer to an S-curve there. And then lastly, the tensor fascia, right, which I'll also uh, have a dumb shape for you to use. So um, tensor fascia, so hip tensor or hip flexor of the leg, um, fascia, and the, it's covered in a large band of fascia like a fibrous material, I will here visualize the muscle like in a sock, right? That there's this covering or material that covers um, the muscle. In terms of drawing it, find the as is, or the anterior superior iliac spine of the pelvis. That's your landmark. I think of the shape as uh, a teardrop. So think of a teardrop that's pointing at a diagonal at your landmark there, and then it's swinging to the outside where it would get that rounded form or rounder shape. And it should come down roughly in line with the hip. So mine might be a little bit low. We'll bring it up some. Uh, to isolate it, just so you have a, a better iconic representation, I draw it like this. So you could think upside down ice cream cone, you could think teardrop, um, you could think whatever is useful and memorable. 
right? Hopefully something that you associate um, on your own will build greater resonance and be more memorable than you reading an anatomy book and um, not connecting with it. Okay, so that's my shape. Uh, again, you see this pinch and stretch less. Um, if the leg is kind of really bent and pushing up in the front near to the pelvis, you might see a pinch in this area just as a consequence of the muscle being pinched. Uh, more often than not, I draw it as is here or kind of more taut. And then let's put it on the side as well. So for, uh, for now, our back or back view is primarily done. In terms of the three that we've put together here, here's our triangle all kind of building around or creating a pattern that tire or donut around the great trochanter which i keep there uh, to double check and is a, a visible landmark that's also integral into the design of these or patterning of these and uh, i think i mentioned earlier that with the rectus femoris this can help flex or bring the leg forward. So that gives you your back, your outside, your forward. Uh, the other thing let's add is the iliotibial track. Uh, so it's sometimes called the IT track. And if you're one that's into working out or running or anything like that, when I go for the very kind of limited working out that I do, the first thing that my trainer has me do is lay down on one of these foam rollers, which maybe you've done. So you lay down on it like this. Here's your pelvis. Here's your, your leg. And then this leg you kind of keep just raised. And then you would kind of hold yourself up on your elbow. And then just roll yourself up and down on the outside of your leg. Right? And it feels like this. That's rolling out your IT track um, or IT band. Uh, and so this is what will kind of get really tight. I don't know if the correct term would be here. Um, if not tight, then knotted. Um, and cause knee pain for runners, if not kind of rolled out or massaged out. Um, but what it does in this area, or the importance of it to your hip, is that it takes this almost as a relay or the um, workings of your hip. And then it will tie them down to the tibia. Right, so what you can see is a band or a track a strap, kind of like a belt that will attach down at the tibia, so hereabouts. As far as a shape, um, I also try to come up with something that would help me remember this. So for IT track, I think of a wrench. For reasons that are more memorable than anatomically accurate, which hopefully the idea you're getting uh, with the way that I use these shapes. You know, wrenches are strict in that they don't flex and stretch. Um, they turn right, around uh, a central area or a nut, uh, as does the IT track around your hip, right? And uh, I use that as a way to project the way that this works here. So think of, you know, the wrench down here. Your tensor doesn't connect to bone down here, it just joins with the wrench. So you could think of the wrench kind of grabbing up into the tensor. The uh, IT track also kind of joins in with the maximus. So you could think of the other kind of end of the wrench here. And then this stiff form or belt pulling down and then connecting to the tibia. And this has a flattening effect on the outside of the leg, whereas the inside, we get a lot of beautiful curves and uh, rhythms. So I think it's worth pointing out now because it's helpful to how the lower leg is abducted, right? That the muscles or the force of the hip also can move the lower leg because of that relay or that transition. But because we're going to want to develop some muscles underneath, we'll, when we start talking about the leg, uh, take it out for just the beginning, right? Then we can put it back on. So in terms of seeing geometries, right? Something that, it, you know, we talked about the Renaissance a, a bit. 
and how fascinating it can be to see the figure in terms of shapes and uh, geometric patterns. Uh, thinking of it as a triangle or as a wrench or um, something along those lines might be a way to abstract that into a pattern that is kind of beautiful in a way right? that you could remember and then, of course, take and exaggerate or see on animals. Um, so let's try to do this here from a couple of different views before we, we end and then look at some images. Uh, so tensor first, kind of identify our teardrop. So same thing here. So in terms of the perspective, this one I'm not going to give a lot of mass or form to. What I'm going to use it to try to show is the front corner of the hip, so front corner of the box. And I'm going to show that by overlapping it behind the medius. And so I've set up like a landscape, a series of overlaps there. Then we could think of the wrench. This big bump would be the vastus lateralis of your femur, but you have to remember that that wrench is going to push down on it. Right? So that would be kind of fitting over. Um, we have a little bit of space here. You could think of that as part of the wrench grabbing up and then flowing down. I have my side view of the femur. So you could think of the wrench just being isolated to that side and then down to the tibia. And then if this isn't a kind of a style of drawing that appeals to you, that's okay. It's not really anything that should ever be done just as a kind of an end in and of itself. I only always think of it as a study method or an analytical method. Uh, but I learn a lot, right? Like now I know that this line is always on the outside. And next time or after I do a few of these and get comfortable with it, I'll know how and where to feed or put these lines without having to set everything up. Or maybe I'm just drawing because I'm really interested in character or creature design. And this is a pattern is evocative of something that I think I could distort to solve something that doesn't really exist yet. So that would be done. And you finish that. If we jump to the, the front, let's just place in our tensor. So I'm thinking of it coming from there. That's our hip and the crest of the pelvis. And its direction is this way. Let's see if we can also find it here. So I'm doing my best to, to think and see it here. Shape, just like we're building a puzzle, fits next to the other. And then here's my teardrop. And then from this view, when the leg is turned so that I don't see much of that outside, I wouldn't include the wrench or the IT track. Um, it's not thick, it's flat. So it's not going to show up with a lot of dimension or um, thickness or mass. This, like I said, also the tensor, I don't describe with a lot of thickness or mass. That's mostly something that kind of indicates a corner shift because of where it sits on the box. Uh, but if we were to do our best to grab our wrench color. Part of the effect of the IT track is that it's pushing down on the lateral quadricep. So it could be pushing it in, creating this straighter line, but it's also kind of visible at the knee. So it'd be a sharper line there. And that might be something that you want to use or just lay in um, early on as something as a, as a reminder. And so there you have it. You know, kind of first kind of move into muscles or study into muscles where we have our core, where we can build into the arms from, and then our muscles around the hip to give stability um, and movement to the legs. Uh, last part of this lecture, I'm going to look at just a few, maybe five minute images from the body's website so that you could see me repeat and kind of move through these steps in a way that I hope helps solidify the way that you understand the material. Okay, uh, see you next week. Hello, welcome back. This is our last component part for this 
fourth week lecture on the anatomy of the torso and then the hip. Uh, so we're going to end just by doing a few drawings. I'm going to set the timer for five minute poses and then uh, push the, the frames so that we get a difference in between the views. And um, so we're going to go ahead and just use this as an opportunity to think about isolating what we understand so far. Um, so I'm really going to just think about process and we're going to focus in on the areas around the um, hips and torso right? so that we see everything that we're talking about in a more lecture based or hopefully not too dry a way as a, a more practical exercise. So you remember I'm, I'm laying everything in to start with my gesture rhythm lines, which we set up on the first week. Trying to keep a lot of those asymmetries and curves going and then wrapping lines. I think I'm going to keep, um, just we're going to isolate this more to the torso and not draw out the whole figure. But I am working still to the weight bearing leg. So let's put this somewhere else right there. Here's a supporting leg. And then I'm going to throw in just the upper arm for now so we get that as a place of context. You're coming towards us and then shapes rib cage and pelvis connections CNS curves in five minutes I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time on proportion I'm not saying I don't need to work on it it's just uh, been trying to get to the muscles something I would forego for the exercise then what are my landmarks or where are my landmarks? Here's the hip. And then lastly, uh, what kind of construction? So I think here we have an almost symmetrical placement of the torso. So I'm going to use some one point perspectives so that we have that leading plane for the pelvis coming towards us. And if you're comfortable with that, you can also do the same thing for the rib cage. Maybe here I'll have it go back a bit though. And I would almost always choose to push this instead of showing this um, from above, because I'll use that as the shoulders. To me, the shoulders are good pushing down. The rib cage is still leaning forward because of the curvature of the thoracic spine. Here's the kind of cylinder for the leg. So that'd be enough to kind of give me a, a starting point. And then let's go into what we studied, abdomen pushing a form line or creating a form intersection, thinking of this shape, pulling down, you're going to design that bullet. Kind of, it looks like it's active in the sense that it's maybe pulling or beginning to pull his torso, your cage towards the pelvis. There's some kind of flex or pinch in it. But alternatively, in terms of just the drawing, I'm going to be using this as a plane to connect the front of the box, rib cage and pelvis. Oblique can drop down, tight and more angular across the rib cage. So think of this as a whole line or rhythm across if it helps. And then more curvature here. So I think there's a bit, there's a bit of a pinch here. And that's going down, this side, meh. Maybe more stretched. Okay, so now I'm thinking about the structure of the hip. This would be the teardrop for that tensor. And then I'll get the gluteus medius. And so C curve or S curve, right? Because it's stretching. This one I would see more of a C curve. See there. No pun intended. Okay, so here is perspective coming out. And then if I have extra time, I could uh, use that just to start to clean up and add some some parts. So now maybe I'll do a better job of looking for where the belly button is and then come in and divide out the different components or the patterns that we built. So that's the repeating pattern, even though these would be asymmetrical. I begin, uh, or my idealized understanding is always that uh, repeating straight or animating straight. Here's some of the oblique lines going towards and then down. And then maybe we could add a hint of the front. We want to try to carve out a little bit more. This is a front. 
That's the side. This is going down and back. Maybe some, some wrapping lines there. And then if I have extra time, let me start to, to work towards the rest. Here's the clavicle. Oh, yeah. Clean up the size of the head. Okay, so next, let's put together a similar start. So I work in, in this method of drawing uh, the same every time. Maybe I'm studying or doing my best to study these relationships, rhythm, positioning of form. And so here we have something that's more of a side. Pelvis is, uh, looks like a tire on this side. And so weight would be here though. And then this is coming out. So thinking of the gesture line as this way. These are form lines to bring that out and towards us. And then this goes back. I'm going to do only part of this arm because it's going to obscure what I wanted to draw for the anatomy. But let's say there's a rhythm going this way. Probably gave too much of a curvature to the brow line. And then rhythm going back. So good enough there. Now let's put shapes. Rib cage. Pelvis. And then I'm thinking of this coming up, but it's not as clear in this turned profile, so I'm going to push it a bit. And then here's the connections. So let's say you C, S. So don't let, if you have these time poses, those decisions paralyze you. Do your best. Just learn as you go and uh, C curve back here, but if I don't get it perfectly right, that's okay. What matters in these time poses is forcing yourself to work through the process um, and repeating that so that you afford yourself the time to make mistakes. I'm going to make a pelvis, and I think there might just be a subtle back here. So I see a little bit of the back plane, and then um, anytime I have a back view, I also push the perspective to be seen from under. And that's uh, just a way to keep these asymmetrical. This, um, maybe a little bit of the back or a little bit of the front. Or if you're on the fence, you just keep it a side view. Right, so the only thing I would never do there is just that. Instead, I would try to show a side view as, as something that's at least cylindrical. That way you get the curvature, right, something that's dimensional. And then, so for this one, let's see the oblique as something that's pinching. And so there's a shape we were talking about, you know, pulling to the back and then up and to the side. So this would be the flatter part. And then as it gets down, there's that heavier or rounder part, teardrop part, if you will. And then as we move down the leg, create trochanter. Pizza shape for the medius. Tensor, little teardrop in front. Maximus, butterfly shape. One egg per plane. And then we have our knee and leg. So if I'm developing these, um, I always start with a cylinder, like we covered, and then advance it to a, a box by way of trying to find the knee and then using that to plane out the rest. It's bringing that uh, noticeable point for the knee or femur up. That way now when I have the box, I can take the maximus and say, oh, that goes to the side. And then, then I can create that form intersection to help add this volume to the, the leg. Also see part of the maximus there. Uh, and then let's add some more up here now that we have some extra time. Um, don't think I see the spinal erectors here too well. So I'd see the scapula. Design for the face. And just going to clean up some of the perspectives. So let's get a perspective for the arm that's coming out towards us. And then form, we go in more or less the same way. Okay. 
Okay, so let's try a couple more. So we have a turn and a bit of a stretch now to the areas we were looking at. So head. Rhythms for the gesture, cervical, thoracic, stretch, lumbar. Now we're kind of seeing that side of the pelvis that might have been dropped some. Arms kind of flowing from these lines up here. And then this is the leg making contact with the ground. For the perspectives, I'm going to treat them almost exactly the same as the view we just did. If you can exaggerate and see some perspective, great. If not, you could use a cylinder or a bucket shape. I think that here I see some. I'm going to choose to see over the pelvis in this view, but because of the slight highlight or rim light on the back there, I'm going to show that plane. But uh, let's do something different here. Let's say that um, the rib cage is a cylinder. I think last time I drew it more as a plane or as a one point perspective box. So here'd be an alternative way that maybe you could address the side view. I'll see it under, just so we create asymmetries. Oops, I kind of jumped the gun on my connections. Okay, so creating the connections on this. Um, let's see our oblique and establish it as a form line. So something that could go across that surface. Then down, so I'm just going to drop the shape from what I would think of as the side. And then we definitely have more of a stretch here. So I'm thinking of an S curve in there and then an S curve here. And then if you want to think of this part as stretching or squatching, we could think of this as a stretched version to that lower portion, whereas in this one, that's more of a squashed version. Um, that's in a lot of this how I'm thinking about muscles. Just so I can continue to get an idea of that action and how it's playing in the design of the figure. Uh, let's do something for the abdomen. So abs, I could see creating that folding pattern that we talked about in terms of its asymmetry from profile, out, back. And maybe we could exaggerate this down here. Uh, I think the, you know, the clear disclaimer or a danger for my way of thinking of drawing or seeing drawing is just that it does have a tendency to take you away from the purely observed. And so it's good to balance that, right? So if you're... Um, you're going to life drawing workshops or uh, doing other types of art practices, it'd be good to balance this or necessary to balance this with something that's directly observational. You're doing a lot of um, analysis or form analysis, design, and so it's good just to ground it in practice of studying and seeing. And it's something I, I know that I always have to push myself to be better at in practice because I teach this a lot. Right, I do this a lot, and I could feel myself getting you know, rusty in, in one. Let's do the hip. I put the doorknob. Um, here's the pizza. And I hope even though I'm going a little bit faster in these, that you could still pick out all the different lines, um, why they're important, why they're being put in, how they build form. Those are the most important things for me. But here's the Maximus, and then kind of getting that C shape or cashew shape, and then starting to let that flow into the femur. And then let's do the tensor here. Does that teardrop? And then any extra time, uh, I like to clean up the face or give like a basic placement for things. I always do it very warily though, because it's easy to get sucked into the face. So I try to move around to kind of treat areas equally um, as I work through the drawing. So, so far we have a kind of a review of the front, how this starts to look from the side and then the other side, but variations here maybe on stretch and pinch. And maybe we could do one more just to see um, 
on the last example. Here I'll try to be a little bit more conscious of starting lighter in case you're um, seeing my lines get a little bit muddy. Okay, so head, cervical, thoracic, stretching, pelvis, one leg up, but contact for the ground here. Even though pelvis is higher, this is pulled back. And then we have a kind of really cool looking arm moving up and arm moving out. Okay, shapes. So the last couple, I haven't been as uh, strict with building up the forms because side views, it's, I'm not dealing with anything that has um, turning, right? So I use the cylinder or the one point box because the landmarks wouldn't have um, given me a clear indication of where form's turning. Here we can do that a little bit more carefully, right? I could see the sternum. I could see the center line. If I go through the belly button down to the center of the pelvis, that symmetry line is closer to this side. That means I have a turn or a three quarter. Find your thoracic arch, which is here. That's the exact moment of turn. So I can use a height and a width and a depth to frame out the front plane. And this front plane is carving into the egg or cutting part of it off. This side plane's doing the same thing, shearing that egg, and then here's the bottom. Um, landmarks here, the, the as is, or the uh, iliac crest. I wanna move that with the tilt. I was a little hesitant at first, I didn't do it enough. Depth, width, and height. That's all the, the planes I need. Okay, so here's my box for the pelvis. I usually spend the most amount of time on this. So you can see in my timer, most or half of my time is just devoted to getting this. And that's because all of the decisions with the muscles that we've talked about are dependent on it. Throw in a couple of cylinders for arms and legs, even if they're short. This one really goes back. And I think could be maybe seen like this or above slightly. And so let's put in our muscles. Here's the abdomen. So form intersection or building that across the plane. Now let's start to warp our bullet shape so that it stretches. So this would be a big S curve. If you want to build it out in straights, you can first, but an S curve is what I'm going to eventually get to. A lot of the times I'll chop things out first as straights. So same thing there. Now if we just follow that line down, we can give ourselves a placement for the oblique. So really in terms of form, one of the most important things for the oblique, if I put in my C curve here, that I, from the structural integrity or the structural um, necessity of the perspective drawing, is that the oblique on that side gives you the plane transition, the bridge, right, between the side, the rib cage, and side of the pelvis. So that's probably my primary read that I want. After that, I can pretty it or make it feel like it has the, you know, the um, striation in the muscle um, or the turn in its own corner, but getting that larger read of a spatial transition between ribcage and pelvis is most important to me. Here's our doorknob. Here's the medius. Here's the tensor. Point to the outside, and then maybe we'd see like a hit of the maximus here. Just a C curve. Uh, pull, bring this down to the outside of the leg. Same thing here. So hopefully this is helpful just in taking and seeing what we do uh, or lecture in a looser, kind of more fun um, 
sketchier way.